Praise the Lord, church. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord? I just came today with a, a joyful expectation that God has something that he wants to do in our service today. Um, I've been meditating and thinking on a, a psalm for several months, and uh, I took the time to actually prepare a video of it because I wanted to read you the psalm as the text for the day, but I thought, it's just so rich. We could maybe get so much more from it if we could see a visual presentation for it. So I know that you're still standing, but this is the reading of the word of the Lord. And so I invite the media to run the slide that is our text for the day. who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of my fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Hallelujah, God, you are excellent, you are wonderful, you are magnificent and mighty, and we give you honor and praise today in your house. We love you and we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We worship you today right here on this little patch of ground in Troy, Michigan and say, have your way among us today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Psalm 8 is a celebration of God. And I like celebrating God. David said, O oh Lord, our Lord. And I love that because, first of all, he was talking about God. He was like saying, Jehovah, you are the Lord over all of us here. You and me together. We are all. He's our Lord, and he unites us together. How excellent, how excellent is our God. How excellent is his name, his majestic name. His name is in all the earth. His signature, as we watched the video and we saw the images of the glory and the majesty of his creation, his signature is on his artwork. But his name is more than that, and it's more than a title. His name speaks to his very character. His name speaks to his nature and what he's like. It refers to the person. When we speak a person's name, when I say Bill Wagner, you think about that person. And when you think about God, when we think about Jesus, we think about God. When we say the name of Jesus, when we speak the name of God, we are thinking about everything that that represents. And it represents so much. He's majestic, glorious. He's illustrious and he's mighty. And we see all these things when we look at the world, when we look at the glory of his creation. And the psalm tells us that he placed his glory above the heavens. And then David, did you, have you ever just read this? And he, it's like David out of the blue takes this random turn. 
He's talking about all this glory of God and the majesty of his name and his creation. And, and then he's, he's like, uh, but uh, what about babies and, and toddlers and, and enemies and avengers? And what does all that have to do with God's creation? Out of the blue, after declaring God's excellence, he said little children had power against the enemies of God. Now that is a mind-blowing verse. This is a key verse. This is a powerful verse. There are enemies in this world, and there is an avenger. And this enemy doesn't care anything about you. He's God's enemy. And it doesn't seem fair. I wasn't born with some chip on my shoulder for God's enemy. But because I was born, I have an enemy on my tail, and so do you. And he is an avenger because he's trying to get even with God through you. Did you ever play monkey in the middle? Two people get on opposite sides, and there's a, a, they got a ball, and there's a person in the middle, and they're throwing the ball back and forth, and the person in the middle's trying to catch the ball, and it's a game. And when Satan is playing his own game, and it's not monkey in the middle. I'm, I'm playing miss me in the middle. <laughs> I don't want to catch what he's throwing my way. Satan got kicked out of heaven because of his own pride and his own rebellion, and he's still kicking and screaming about it. He's not playing a game with a ball, though. He's got fiery darts. He wants to inflict pain, and he wants to inflict it upon you. And we're just trying to avoid getting clobbered by the avenger. But the good news is that Satan is not God's equal. He's not God's equal. This is not an even Stephen game. Not even close. God has all power and authority, and his word is telling us something important in this psalm and in this verse in particular. If you'll have faith, if you'll trust me like a child trusts its mother to feed her, if you'll have that kind of trust, if you'll worship me, I will still the enemy. I will silence your avenger. God is going to do the work if we will trust in him and we will worship him. And isn't that just excellent? Isn't that just wonderful? God isn't just excellent. He has a wonderful plan, a wonderful plan for you and me. He established this plan, the Bible says, because of his enemies. Think about that. God ordained this plan and one of the key reasons, I believe, was to show rebellious, high-minded, manipulative Satan and the fallen angels a powerful truth. That he is able to defeat his greatest foe with the vulnerable and the weak, the boys and girls. God can take young and undeveloped, and when they do the opposite of what Satan did, that's a key. When they love God for who he is... Didn't we sing about that today? If they, we love him for who he is and we worship him, he will make those weak and vulnerable ones into a powerful force to still and silence the enemy and the avenger. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that excellent? How excellent. How gracious and how good is our God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God, I don't have to be strong. I don't have to be mighty. I don't have to be full of wisdom. I just have to be yours. I have to trust you that you love me. When the enemy sees the worship and the childlike faith of God's children, he can't say anything because what is his major mode of operation? Accusations. And you're over there worshiping God, and he's trying to throw accusations at you, and they just don't hit. They just bounce right off because you're worshiping God. You're exhibiting your love and devotion to him. His accusations are shut down, and he is silenced and stilled because you are worshiping your God with a childlike faith. Think with me 
for a moment back to the day of Pentecost, and I believe this principle is exhibited here. On the day of Pentecost, it wasn't literal babies that were being filled with the power of God, but they were dependent on him. They were trusting in his promises. They were humble and obedient and gathered together in prayer. And when the Bible talks about infants, it's not always talking about physical age. We talk about the children of God. It's not just the biologically young. Once you hit age five, you don't qualify anymore. No, it's not just that. When Moses was talking about the children, he was including all from any generation. And when in John, 1 John 4, 4, the Bible says, Ye are of God, little children. This is a letter to the church. This is a letter to the church. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, don't you love this verse in, when we're seeing it in context of this beautiful psalm of David? John was talking to born-again believers. He was talking to those, and he called them little children. And he said, you have overcome, and you will overcome all the evil spirits in this world. Hallelujah. And John went on to say in the same letter, 1 John 5, 3 through 4, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. They're not cruel, and they're not too hard to bear. For whatsoever is born of God, and he's talking about you and me, if we're born again of the Spirit of God, whatever is born of God, we overcome the world. And we have this victory. This is the victory that overcomes the world, what is it? Our faith. It's that simple. It's your faith. Your faith. That's the victory that overcomes the evil of this world. Will we believe God is who he says he is? Will we believe that he will do what he said he will do? Will we worship him in spirit and truth like he says and, and put his word to the test? This verse, I believe, is even talking about testing the spirits, or maybe it's a different one that I'm going to talk about in a bit, but this morning I was even reading about testing the spirits, and God has invited us to test his spirit. And when we test his spirit, we'll find that his words are true. Now, babies don't stay babies forever. My youngest baby is getting married next year, but she's still my baby, and she always will be. And relationships change over the years. Hope and I, we talk different than we used to when she was two. We communicate, and we even have different expectations in our relationship because we're in a different season of life. But I hope that my baby will always have a childlike trust in her mother's love, in her mother's goodwill, and in her mother's good intention for her relationship. And that's what I want you to get today. God isn't saying don't grow up. He doesn't want us to stay in the spiritual nursery. He wants us to be changed. He wants us to be mature. But we have got to understand that David was painting a word picture for us when he was talking about infants and sucklings so that we would understand something important about maintaining our relationship with God so we could have power over the enemy. Because just because you get born again doesn't mean that the enemy is like, well, I guess I'm done with that one. God's got that one. I'll just go try somebody else. No, he's going to keep working. And we still need to have the power to overcome the enemy. But I've got good news for you today. You don't have to be all grown up. You don't have to be all grown up to be all powerful. And you don't have to have all knowledge and all wisdom. The more I study, the more I really do know how little I really know. You don't have to have all knowledge to know that God is God and, and be victorious if you know who your daddy is. If you can trust that he has a plan and that he loves you. And on the day of Pentecost, it wasn't the eloquent rabbinical teachers that God filled with the Holy Ghost. He poured out his spirit on women, men and women that were young in the faith. They were uneducated. They were like children, and they were the firstborn 
in the New Testament church. They were the first ones on the day of Pentecost who would utter the praises of God in unknown tongues. It probably sounded like baby talk. It might have sounded like babble. It didn't make any sense to the people around them, but God used those men and women who were humble. They were humble before him. Those are the ones that he used to establish his church. And that church is a vibrant church. That church was a healthy church. That church was a powerful church. That church is a church that has power over all the power of the enemy. And the gates of hell will not prevail over the church that God established through these young, ignorant, uneducated, spiritual youths. Satan wanted to be like God. And from the beginning, he's used the same tactics, dropping those questions, dropping those doubts. Does, does the Bible really say, did God really mean? He's still doing the same old thing, the same old way. God isn't who he says he is. What's he attacking? Your faith. He doesn't want you to believe. He's attacking your faith with questions and doubts, accusations, and trying to get you to take on guilt for something that's already under the blood of Jesus. He wants us to try to rely on our own know-how and our own power. He wants to convince you that you can do it on your own. You can be a maverick. You don't have to run with the pack. You can do it all on your own. You don't really have to be a part of the church. But that's not God's plan because, oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. He's brought us into fellowship and community of believers, and we're supposed to come together. These are accusations that he's still accusing with today, and the enemy is still attacking, and the avenger is still working his game. But I'm here today to tell you, you don't have to play his game. Do you ever get requests on your phone for games? I don't even have a game on my phone. But you can get a game request and you don't have to play it. I'm not playing games with Satan because he's not really playing. He doesn't have the monkey in the middle ball. He's trying to hit so he can score against the Lord. And he's got those fiery darts. But this is how you win. Not by might. <laughs> Not by my power. But by the Spirit of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He's given us the power by his Spirit to overcome every fiery dart of the enemy. Psalm 3.3, the Bible says, Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. Oh, he's got his dart. He's got his bow and arrow, and he's shooting them at the people. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, the glory and the lifter of my head. The enemy's trying to get you to drop your head and to feel like you're worthless and to feel like you're hopeless and to feel like you can't believe the word of God and the promises of God. But God's a promise maker and he's a promise keeper. Amen, pastor. He's a promise maker and he's a promise keeper. And when the enemy is shooting his fiery darts, thou, O oh Lord, art a shield for me, the glory and the lifter up of my head. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you, God, that you are my shield of faith. Hallelujah. I just have to be in you. And you've got this spiritual cloaking device around me. And the enemy can't hit me. He is my strength and my shield. Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and shield. My heart trusts in him. I have faith in him. And he helps me. Thank you, Jesus. When we have God's shield of faith, the Spirit of God around us, we have divine influence that can extinguish fire and suppress the impact of his weapons. And it doesn't mean he's not going to throw them. It doesn't mean you're not going to feel an impact. I feel the hit when the dart hits the shield. But I'm not going to be taken out by the enemy, by his weapon. Your faith, your childlike faith, the sweet praises of a newborn babe, that is going to take Satan down. We've got to have it to even enter the kingdom, but we've got to keep it. Faith Apostolic Church of Troy.
I don't know about you, but I know I can't take on the devil and win. He's been around for at least thousands of years, at the very least. I'm just a mortal person with a birthday in the 1965, not so long ago in the grand scheme of life. I have a limited amount of understanding. I'm just mortal, and so are you. I don't have what it takes to take Satan down on our own, but if you and I will turn our devotion, turn to the Lord with childlike faith, to our Abba Father, if we will trust Trust him. We will make it. He can do what we can't do. And this, this is what the psalmist was talking about. This is the means that God ordained to give strength and rest to you. This is the means that God uses to bring the enemy's purposes to an end. God wants to use you to defeat the enemy, the works of the enemy in the world. It's faith. It's faith. I, was, I, I have a thing for words. I really like words. And, and we are named what? Faith Apostolic Church of Troy. If we don't have faith, first of all, we're not living up to our name. We've got to be a church that has, is filled with faith. It's, it's our foundational word. It's, and God is calling us to, he's calling me, and I believe he's calling many of us to back to a simple faith. And this is not talking about faith in the simple, even though the plan of salvation is simple. But God is so complex. And this is not a simple-minded faith. I reject that. Oh, it's not simple-minded. Our God is sophisticated. Our God is wise. Our God is brilliant. But the faith that we're talking about is a straightforward, uncomplicated, elementary faith in God that understands he's complex, that understands he's bigger than all that, that understands he can do anything everywhere, anytime, but I simply trust that he can and that he will. He's so big. He's everything we need, and we can trust in him. If you want to still the avenger, if we want to stop the enemy from moving in our lives, we need to pray in the spirit and worship in spirit and truth. And that is God's excellent plan. The people in the upper room, they didn't fill themselves with God's spirit. And little babies sure can't take care of themselves. And no wonder David expressed such amazement and such wonder because Psalm 8 was telling us about this creator who created the universe and everything in it. And in his plan, he created a very special role for humanity. He made human beings to have a certain place in his created order, and that's just below the angels that ministered around his throne. And I'm here today to tell you that he didn't change his mind when Adam and Eve messed up. He knew they were going to do it, and he knows that we will too. He didn't change his mind about David who wrote this psalm. When David fell, and he fell hard, and not just once, more than once, how many lives were killed? How many people were influenced because of David's sin? God is bigger than your mistakes. He's bigger than your failures. God has a plan, and his plans are greater, and he is greater. His grace is greater. He is excellent. He's excellent. And if we will humble ourselves and call on God, we can fulfill his purpose and have victory over the enemy. But to do this, we can't be like Satan. We can't try to take it for ourselves. We can't decide... I'm the boss of me. <laughs> we have to let God be the boss of me so we can be who he created us to be. But I don't, I don't think it's wrong to celebrate who you are. Celebrate. God created you, and he created you with dignity. He created you with purpose. I'm not an angel, but I'm not a devil. God has his hand on me. He has his hand on you. Let's celebrate who he created us to be. We have a place in the purpose of God. In the same way he created the moon and the stars and he, and he put them in place. And I know this is just poetic, but, but think about it just for a minute. Imagine the hand of God just picking up Jupiter with his fingertips, 
maybe just his thumb and his forefinger. He's got Jupiter here. <laughs> and he's like, there you go. There's Jupiter. And then, oh, he, let's get Saturn now. Hmm. Yeah, right there. Go that way. He did all that with all the planets, all the, the sun and the moon and all the stars. Then he started working on the earth and he started sculpting the, the landscape and building the mountains and filling the oceans with water. And it all reflected his glory. And then David, after thinking about all those things, he asked the question, what is man? Just compare this little insignificant, teenier than an ant, <laughs> if you're looking from a, the Hubble telescope or whatever, to all of the glory and majesty and immensity of the universe. What is man that you are mindful of him? And I think it's very important that David didn't ask, who is man? What is man? And I've been so guilty of saying, I don't even know who I am. I don't have to know who I am. I have to know what I am. Because pride is the one asking, who am I? But when I ask, what am I? I am a servant of the Most High God. I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking about what I'm supposed to be doing. What is man? We were created with a purpose by the hand of God. When David started talking about man, he wasn't referring to just one person. He was indicating all of mankind, men and women who were fearfully and wonderfully made, but they were also frail and weak. Every one of us here, we've had our super day where we could climb the tallest mountain, and then we've had the one where we didn't feel like we could get out of the bed. We're frail and weak, but we're also fearfully and wonderfully made. And this psalm includes you and me. And this psalm includes David. And this psalm included Jesus. When David asked, what is man and the son of man, who was he talking about? Well, this could be Hebrew parallelism. It could just be he was kind of stating one thing and then restating in another way because they are similar in concepts. What is a man that you're mindful of him? What is his descendants that you would visit him? If you're mindful of someone, you care for them, you visit them. They, they are very related statements, and God did reach down to visit his people. But what is so beautiful about this is that the word man in Hebrew here isn't speaking about the man Adam and Eve before the fall. It's talking about you and me in our fallen state. It is talking about the man that failed It's talking about the man that failed. What is that man that you are mindful of him? That you would care for him. That you would watch over him. And I just think about the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God. And I think, how, how excellent is that? How excellent is that what is man that he would set his love on us and that he would keep looking to us with mercy that he would care for us from generation to generation and God is mindful of you today and he's willing to visit you today John Calvin said this is a marvelous thing that God thinks upon men and remembers them continually I'm so glad I haven't been forgotten. He hasn't forgotten you or me or his promises. The word says that we were made a little lower than those angels, but what did he do? He crowned us with glory and honor. And I don't have time to go into all this means, but I do believe that we will only be crowned with glory and honor when we are humble and obedient to the Lord. I I don't have Bible for this. It's just something that came to me as I was praying and preparing to speak today. But could the level of the glory, could the level of the honor that he crowns us with be uh, in equal measure to the level of the humility that we have, to the level of the obedience that we serve? The more obedience, the more humility, the more he is crowned in our lives and the more honor 
we bring to him, and that is made known to the world through us. But we don't just get glory and honor because we got born. You have to opt into this plan. Every October, I get a new health insurance thing. I got to opt in for the program that I want. I have to choose to join, and you have to choose to join the family of God because our default mode is sinner, every one of us. But every one of us has the opportunity to know the Lord because of the grace of God. And we have an invitation to be born into the family of God. It's something that happens because we have that faith, that childlike faith in the gift that God has given us. And then we respond with humility and obedience. We are not going to come to God with pride in our hearts. We are coming to God with knowing that we need him knowing that he's greater, knowing that we're just frail and we're not perfect. We don't have a right to fellowship with the holy God and with the angels in glory. But because of what he did, we can. But we got to opt in. And that requires humility and obedience. And what did Jesus himself say in John 3 and 5? He was answering Nicodemus and he said, Verily, verily, that means truly, truly, I am telling you the truth. Except a man, a woman, a person is born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. So how do we fulfill this? Jesus didn't leave us hanging. He told us how to do it. His word tells us in Acts 2.38, the people that he spent all those years developing and teaching and, and showing them the way and then filled them, empowered them with this spirit. He gave them the plan and they shared it on that day of Pentecost. Acts 2.38 tells us, repent. What is repentance? That means you've got to turn away from doing it your own way. You can't be like Satan, the evil one that says, you know, I know you're God, but I just want to be like you. I want to make my own decisions. I want to determine for myself what's good and what's evil. No, we've got to turn away from that, and we've got to turn to God and be baptized. How many of you? Every one of you. How in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's that spirit. We've got to have that spirit if we want that shield that's really going to save us from the fiery darts of the adversary. And when we turn to the Lord and follow his plan, we have the stain of all the sin removed from our lives. It's the best feeling ever coming up out of that water. And feeling the weight of all your sins washing away. And then being born again with the Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you. And he makes you a part of the family of God. We become holy siblings. And we become partakers of a holy calling. And he invites us to partake of his nature and his glory. Hallelujah. And we're, when we're a part of him, the things of this world and the power of this world, the pull of this world, they don't have the authority over us that they did before. We have power because greater is he that is in me, he that is in you, than the pull and the things of this world, even the pull and the things of this flesh. This flesh still fights against the will of God. But I can put it under my feet. Why? Because God was mindful, and the Son of Man visited. He came. Jesus came, and he restored what was broken. The term Son of Man in verse 4 of Psalm 8, it was used elsewhere in the Scripture in the Old Testament and the New. In Psalms and in Daniel, it specifically referred to the coming Messiah. Who's this fallen man that you'd be mindful of him? But who's this son of man that you would visit him? It's Jesus. In the New Testament, the same word son of man was used 85 times. And so many of them are capitalized and referring directly to Jesus Christ. Psalm 8 is a messianic psalm. It's a call to worship and it's a call to action. Because God wants you to know him. And when you know him, what does the word tell you? It tells you you're going to do great things. You're going to be strong. And you're going to do exploits. The kingdom of heaven is going to suffer because you have taken on the 
name and the power of God. Hallelujah. Just because you're walking in victory, because you have that childlike faith in God, the enemy is silenced. The enemy is stilled. His power has no influence in your life, and that's going to bring deliverance and hope to others. When it comes right down to it, how much is your life worth? You might can accumulate some stuff. Maybe you got an IRA and a cabin on the lake somewhere. But when this life is over, it's over. What about you? Well, let me just tell you how much you're worth. You're worth about a buck. If they take your body and they distill all the chemicals out of it and the, all those elements, your body's worth about a buck. Our bodies, however, and our souls have very different values. We have an eternal value. On the flip side of that coin, what's your body worth? What's your soul worth? Your soul is worth the blood of Jesus Christ. Your soul is incredibly valuable to God. Hallelujah. The Son of Man came. Jesus came and he defeated his enemies. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 27, Jesus did put all things under his feet. And every enemy of God is already defeated. But we've got to get on the winning team or he's not going to be defeated in our lives. One day everything in this world is going to get all rolled up into one. And Jesus Christ is going to be Lord of all. No knee is going to not bow. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is is Lord it's gonna happen one day but it's got to happen today in my life if I'm gonna be on the right side on that judgment day hallelujah I want to be on the right side I want to be in the bride of Christ hallelujah if we look to the New Testament we see Hebrews tells us that Jesus fulfilled Psalm 8 because Jesus was God and Jesus was man this is Majestic and excellent. David knew that God had promised the Messiah out of his own family line. Just imagine throwing that in there. Imagine how David felt when he was writing this psalm. Not just about the fallen man and not just about the man to come. He was going to come out of my line, my family. That's pretty amazing. The, the prophets told us about the coming of Jesus. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The mighty God. The son is the mighty God. The son is the everlasting father. And the son is the prince of peace. And I don't know about you, but I want all that stuff in my life. I want to have that counselor. I want to have that God who's got the right plan, who's got the right strategy. I want to have this wonderful God, this amazing, admirable, distinguished. I, I, I like the idea of being a person of dignity and worth. Our world doesn't hold that up for much value these days, but I, I like the idea. And our God, he's mighty. He always is what he was yesterday. He is today, and he's going to be tomorrow. He's the everlasting father because he's the father of us all. But I just believe the word is not indiscriminate or haphazard or random and that he put Prince of Peace last. He's going to be the captain over all the peace. When all that stuff comes rolled up into one, he's going to be the prince of all the peace, the shalom of God. He's going to be the governor of that. That's talking about wholeness and completeness and soundness and security and tranquility and even friendly relations. We're talking about one anothering here at church. He's the prince of one anothering. He's the prince of friendly relations. Jesus is the head and the keeper of all that. And how excellent is all that? I want to have a sound mind. I want to have a peaceful spirit. I want to have healed and whole relationships. He's the prince, the governor, the captain of all that. Oh, how excellent. How excellent is that? Jesus came to make us whole. He came to bring us back into friendship with God. He came to restore dignity and purpose and to restore dominion over the rulers of the darkness of this world. 
An invisible scepter fell from man's hands in the Garden of Eden. But God, in that very first book of the Bible in Genesis 3.15, promised to bring one who would crush the head of the enemy. So today, son of man, today, daughter of Eve, God wants you to know he's got his eye on you. He's mindful of you. You're the apple of his eye, and his arms are open. Even when he sees darkness and hardness and sin in our lives, he knows we're frail, and he's still willing to come and visit us if we will turn to him. With the faith of a child, he knocks at the door, and he invites us. When we come to Jesus with that simple faith like those children, the babes, and the sucklings, if we're coming in faith, we're, we shouldn't be arguing about what he asks us to do. We need to be humble and obedient and just do it because we know that our Father knows best. And when the Bible talks about those babes and sucklings, it is giving us a picture to learn from. Just imagine, if you will, somebody small enough to play in the yard outside, but still be carried in someone's arms. Imagine that those who are naturally unable to accomplish much of anything without the help of someone else. The verse here references babies that are still dependent on their mother's milk, and in our culture, we don't nurse as long as they did then. These babies were still running around. They still would have been out in the yard or playing, and, and, and maybe four or five years old, they, they, they didn't get weaned until they were much older. So it's not just talking about a baby that's not able to crawl or move. But consider this. It's truly amazing that babies, long before they're born, have you ever seen the ultrasound pictures of the baby sucking their thumb? Before they're ever born, they know how to suck. It's an instinct. And when the baby is born, it opens its mouth and reaches for what it needs to survive. And when you are ready to be born again, by the Spirit of God. You're going to feel something, an instinct, something stirring inside of you, something that's responding to the presence of God, something that wants to make you cry out to Him. Oh God, I can tell you are real. I feel your presence in this place and I hear the word of truth and it's reaching into my heart and you're drawing me into a closer relationship with you. They're, you're calling me back to a childlike faith, a simple faith, a trust in the God who can do anything and anytime, anywhere. Jesus taught us that we can't enter into the kingdom of God unless we come as a little child. God compares worship to childlike trust in the provision and help of his parents. I'm going to help my kids if I can. God has established this type of faith, this type of worship to ordain strength in your life. The, he has established pure worship as the path to your might and power. It seems like it's weakness, but it really is bringing power and strength and might into your life. I've had children. I birthed three of them, and there's nothing like it. When your little one comes toddling up to you, might not even have a full mouth load of teeth yet, but they just lift their hands. I love you, Mommy. There's nothing that compares to that feeling. And that's what God, he wants that type of love from you. That simple love, that sweet love, that elementary love. This is a foundation. David knew it. The writer of Hebrews knew it. The apostle of Paul knew it. Peter and all of the apostles, they experienced that in our childlikeness and in our humility, we can partake of the majesty and power and glory of God. And he reveals his power and glory by defeating his enemies. <laughs> and he defeats them through the weak, 
through the insignificant ones who know that their only power is through him. Hallelujah. I don't have power on my own, but through God. God rules the world through the weakness of man. <laughs> God rules the world through the weakness of man. How excellent. <laughs> How excellent. Can you imagine God talking to the devil? You know, you didn't make it, Lucifer and company, but have you considered my servant Marvin? Have you seen how he still praises me? Have you seen how he still worships me? Even in the face of, of obstacles and, and discouragement and trials, you got power. Have you seen my servant, Bill? Just look at them. Do you see him worship? Do you see that big smile and those uplifted hands? Do you see his faith? You know, they never knew me like you knew me. But they believe, and they love me, and they trust me, and I am empowering them. And their worship executes vengeance upon the, the enemies. Their worship binds the kings and the powers, the principalities of darkness with chains and fetters. Your worship, your worship binds the power of the enemy with irons and fetters and releases captives and ushers in glory and silences the accusations of the enemy and stills the activity of the avenger. Hallelujah. Doesn't that just make you want to worship Jesus for a minute? Hallelujah. God, I thank you. I thank you that you've given us the opportunity to access your divine strength, your divine power. God, that you use us in your great mercy, in our fallen states. You still use us when we trust in your ability, when we trust in your provision, God. You will use us to bring down spiritual strongholds and darkness in our lives and others and you will use us to bless your world hallelujah oh thank you Jesus thank you Jesus I want to apply the principles of this great psalm today hallelujah hallelujah there are people in this house today whose lives have gotten complicated and with it the childlike simplicity of faith has been hampered, hamstrung. But God today wants to remind you, sons and daughters, that if you'll just return to your childlike faith, he will fill you with power. You will be restored to dignity and purpose, even in your challenges. If you've never known Jesus in the way that the Bible teaches. If you've never experienced God, all it takes is faith, humility, and obedience, and he is going to meet you. He is going to visit you. He will fill you with his spirit. He will wash away all the sin, every trace of sin, guilt, and shame. If you would like to be baptized today, we can take care of that for you. We have water, we have gowns, towels, and hair dryers, and we would be thrilled to, to, to celebrate this step in your walk of faith. God, he's, he's trusting you, and you might not see the whole end of the plan, but that baby, when they first start walking, they're not running across the way, but they lift up off the ground, and they take the first step. And so maybe that's what God is calling you today. You don't see all the way and what all this means, but you know that you're tired of sitting on the floor and doing the army crawl and trying to get to where you want to go in this life. And God says, stand up and take the first step and I will meet you there. Hallelujah. God wants to meet us in this place. He's come to visit us and he's come to dwell among us. Hallelujah. I invite you to stand with me today and I am the musicians and singers to come. God wants us to turn to him afresh today and say, Lord, forgive me of trying to understand my own way, trying to take things into my own power. 
trying to manipulate even and make things happen, even if I had good intentions. God, I'm tired. I'm tired of feeling the fiery darts of the enemy. I'm feeling the heat from the fiery darts of the enemy. And so, God, I'm asking you to surround me again, to be my shield, to be my strength, to be my fortress, oh God. Renew my faith, oh God. Let faith arise. Let faith arise. Faith can grow. God doesn't send down faith. He's already put some faith in you. It's got to grow, and it can arise in your heart today. And when we walk into to the sunshine of his presence when we walk into his glory hallelujah God is inviting us each and every one of us to be a son and daughter to walk with dignity and purpose and joy to be a holy sibling in the family of God if you would like to visit with Jesus today have your strength renewed Make that first step, or a second step, or a third step, or a five bazillionth step in the right direction. Come to the altar today, and we'll pray with you, and we'll pray for you, because we believe in the community of the family of God. When you come to God, you don't walk alone anymore. He is with you. So I invite you to come today. Oh, God, I thank you for the beautiful things that you've taught us in this psalm. Oh, God, you are excellent and you are great. You are full of mercy and compassion, oh, God. I thank you, Jesus, that you are mindful of us, even in our fallen state. You are mindful of us, oh, God. But you desire to give us victory over our enemies if we will just come to you with that simple childlike faith and trust in you, a great and a mighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The enemy wants to put you on his trophy shelf, but God said no. God said no. God said no. Hallelujah. Jesus, have your way today. Have your way today, oh God. Hallelujah. You're amazing, God. You're amazing, God. You can tell the way of You can heal the pain, you can clean the stain, you can turn our tears into songs of praise. You're amazing God. wept over Jerusalem and he said oh how I long to gather you in my arms he's longing to gather you hallelujah oh God let us be gathered oh God gathered oh God hallelujah 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 Jesus oh it's where we belong it's where belong. It's where we belong. Oh God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this time in your presence. God, I thank you for all the ways that you've touched so many people as individuals and even us together as a community of believers because you are our Lord oh God and you have brought us into relationship one with another God you're doing work as we throw ourselves upon uh, you oh God like a child runs into a room and jumps on dad's lap God let us have that kind of abandon to to run into your presence and expect that you're going to catch us and expect that you're happy to see us, oh God. You said that we could come boldly to your throne. Boldly, oh God. And so let us remember as we go forward through this week, Lord, that you have your eye on us and you're looking at us with love. Help us to remember to be 
humble and obedient so that we can be crowned with glory and honor and that you can use us in your divine plan and your divine purpose through our worship and our simple faith to bring damage to the kingdom of darkness because we are walking in love, walking in agreement with your word, and walking as a community of faith together in the name of Jesus. Amen.